The A7 III came out about six months ago, and I managed to get my hands on it day one, and I've been using it solidly ever since. I want to talk to you today about what I think six months later. Does it still live up to the hype? Is it still worth waiting for it? Because there's a huge wait still. Yeah, let's talk about that. So to give you a brief history, before I owned this guy, I owned the A6300 and the A6000. I had a few APS-C lenses, the Sigma 16mm f1.4, the Sigma 30mm f1.4, as well as a couple of full frame lenses, the Sony 7200 f4 and the Sony 85 f4. If you haven't watched my previous video talking about this, this was my first full frame mirrorless camera. Well, full frame camera in general. I sold the A6000 and used some of that money to purchase this one. So this became my A camera or my main camera for most stuff. And then I used the A6300 as my B camera or my backup camera. So I managed to get this on day one. I did pre-order it at Henry's here in Canada and managed to get lucky. Mine was in one of the first shipments that arrived at the store. That being said, we're six months later and there's still like a three month delay if you wanted to get this. So if you wanted to pick it up at Henry's or Amazon, you're looking at two to three months at least to get your hands on it. So it's still an extremely popular camera. Part of that is because it's a full frame 4K shooting camera made by Sony, which a lot of people are moving to now. And it's a very, very low price compared to some of the other competitors. I think personally that is the biggest thing why people still want it. The price is the biggest appealing factor about this camera. So I've used this for a ton of different things, a lot in six months time. Commercial shoots, family films that I've just shot for myself, tons of weddings. I think I've shot probably 12 weddings on this now, that's videos. Event coverages, I've done vlogging style stuff, lots and lots of photos. Everything I'm gonna talk about is true, it's honest, it's a real person's point of view of heavily using this for six months and what I like, what I don't like, that kind of stuff. So let's start with the things that I like. Right now you'll see that I do have the grip on here. I love the size of this both with and without the grip. I would probably leave the grip on it all the time if it wasn't for the fact that I still have the Xeon Crane 1 and it can't support the weight of this with a lens on it. But with or without this, the size of this is great, I love it. It's such a small camera without the grip that you can throw it in your bag, but with the grip, if you aren't carrying around a bag and you're just using this for the day handheld, it's a great size too. You can get two batteries in there. Huge amount of battery life for a minimum four day shoot. And yeah, with and without the grip, I love its size. The battery life is absolutely incredible compared to the A6300 and A6000. The new Z batteries, they are so good. I think I mentioned before, I can shoot an entire day's wedding on video uh, of what I need and I'm gonna be using probably about a battery and a half. I don't need to use anything more than that. Which is nuts because I used the A6000 and A6300 before and no exaggeration, I had 10 batteries in my bag split between those two cameras. So if you said five or six batteries each, quite a big difference, quite a huge improvement. The Z batteries in this camera are incredible. Not a lot of people talk about this, but I do believe the color science used in the A7 III is different to that of the A6300. I use the Autumn Leaves Creative Style. It just adds a little bit of change to the saturation uh, and the contrast to your image. And I really like it. All my videos are shot in it. But I use it both on the A6300 and on the A7 III. And I can tell you when you try and color match them in post, there is definitely a difference. So. I do believe the a7 III has a different color science. And having used it, I much, much prefer it. The skin tones look a lot nicer. Right now I'm shooting on the a6300, so this might look a little bit different to what I usually shoot. So I can tell you there is a definite difference between the two cameras, and the a7 III one is, is better in my opinion. It's a much nicer, truer to life. The skin tones are nicer, I just prefer it. The low light on this is really good. People compared it to the Sony a7S II. I don't know if it's quite as good as that. There's a ton of comparisons with it. I can use this happily up to 10,000 ISO, and there's a little bit of noise, but it doesn't take away from the story of the day if I'm shooting a wedding. For the most part, it's the story that matters, a little bit of degradation in quality, a little bit of noise, I can deal with that to get the shot that I need to get if I'm using an F4 or something like that. I haven't had any issues with the camera freezing. With the A6300, there's a couple of times I was shooting long sequences and the camera locked up. And it did save the files, but it's a little bit scary when that happens. Haven't had any issues like that with the A7 III. I shouldn't have said that because now my next shoe, I bet I'm gonna have issues with it. You do have the two card slots. So I have always shot with two cards, one on each, and I use one as the backup of the first one. So basically it copies the contents of the first card to the second card, and I always have two cards that have both the same thing on it. So if it did fail, you have that there. Again, a nice feature of the A7 III. But yes, no issues with freezing or anything like that. No issues with overheating. And 
I can tell you this in all honesty, I did a few tests and I've done real world tests with this. I was shooting non-stop for about half an hour in the middle of the Canadian blistering heat. Yes, it gets hot in Canada. It's not snowy all year round. There is not igloos here all year round. It gets very hot here in Canada in the summer, sometimes in excess of 40 degrees. And I was using this camera solidly for 30 minutes outside and no issues with overheating. There was one point where the overheating symbol came on, but I was nearing the end of that clip and it just showed me that it was getting hot, but I didn't have issues with it actually turning off. I do have mine set to the higher option for when it automatically turns off though. Don't know if that makes a difference. But yes, no real problems with overheating at all. It's held up well. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean the body. You can't really see here, but, well, maybe you can. Have a quick look around there. If I took pictures of that right now and put it online for sale, it would look brand new. And that's a really good thing. This camera has taken some serious abuse, and by abuse I mean thrown in and out of a bag, attached to many different lenses, on and off tripods, it's been on my hip, on a strap, it's banged into stuff, it's been knocked around in my bags. I firmly believe that camera equipment is, is basically a tool. It should be treated like a tool, you should not baby your camera equipment. And when I mean baby, I mean there should never be a situation where you don't go and shoot a photo or do a video because you're scared that your camera is going to get damaged, hurt, wet, dirty. You should never be in that situation. If you are, then you're not treating your camera correctly. These are tools. They are designed to be used like tools. You should treat it well, but at the same time, you should never be avoiding a shot because you're scared of it getting a little scratch or something like that. But needless to say, it has held up extremely well. There honestly isn't a mark on it at all. And I'm speaking with all honesty, there's not a mark on it. I've had a screen protector on here since new. Uh, I have replaced one. Uh, it started to peel off. It hasn't cracked. Um, so make sure you get a screen protector. But yeah, other than that, there's not a mark on it. Still in great shape. Also to talk about how it's held up, I haven't had any issues with uh, getting dirt on the sensor. I seem to have this issue quite a bit with the A6300. I don't know why, because the sensor is bigger on this. But I can tell you three times off the top of my head, where I've had a little bit of dust on the sensor just from quickly looking between changing lenses. Two of which I managed to get off with the blower, a little blowy thing. Don't know why I'm doing that, but that's what you do with a blower. And it blows the dust off. And the other time I used a sensor swab, one wipe threw it in, it got that dust off too. Seemed to have a lot more issues with the A6300 than I have had with this, and that's a good thing. You don't want dust on your sensor. It shows up in your photos and video, and it's you can't get rid of it. With photos you can, you can go into Photoshop, but for video it's it's a pain. So you don't want that on there, and I haven't had issues with that, so that's good. I can already tell this is going to be a long video. Very useful for you guys, but it feels like I've done a lot of talking already. And so let's move on to things that I haven't had a good experience of or don't like so much about this. So this is not really something that I don't like, but it's something that transpired, something that happened. I'm guessing it's something that was inevitable. I wanted to move to all full frame glass. And if you don't know, Sony full frame glass is expensive. It's not the cheapest in the world compared to say Canon and Nikon full frame lenses. So I have now sold all of my APS-C lenses, including the kit lenses, the Sigma 16 mil. Yes, I sold that amazing camera lens. I've moved to all full frame Sony lenses. So you might be asking why. You did a video before talking about how you can use your APS-C lenses on your full frame camera, and yes, you can. However, there's one feature that I started to use a ton and I haven't been able to stop using it and I use it all the time. The ability to shoot in crop mode on video with no loss of quality is fantastic. It's such a useful feature. It makes every lens basically two focal lengths. So a prime lens, a zoom lens, a telephoto lens, whatever you're using, it now becomes double the focal length. So 55 becomes an 82, and 85 becomes a 127, I think. So using crop mode with this camera is so useful, so convenient, and I love it. And I wasn't getting that feature when I was using the APS-C lenses because it was already in crop mode. So yeah. Sold all my APS-C lenses, and now I have all full-frame glass. The lenses I now have are the 70 to 200 f/4, the 85 f/1.8, the 16-35 f/4, the 55 f/1.8, and yeah, that's it. I'm looking at another lens as well, but we'll keep that quiet for now. So I moved to completely full-frame lenses, which was really expensive, but do I regret it? Absolutely not. Now I have everything I need for this, and I'm really happy with the setup I've got. Yeah, that APS-C mode is just too good to not have. 
once you start using it, you would want the same thing. It's just too good. It's too convenient, too good, and if you're using a Prime that you love, you now have a little bit of extra reach and too convenient. Too convenient. What a problem to have, eh? All right, this is the major issue that I have with the a7 III, and I did an entire video on it. The screen. Two issues with the screen. The main one that I did the video about, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I did a whole video on it that I'll put up here. I hope this is the right side. Basically, the exposure doesn't show properly sometimes. You'll be shooting something and it'll look overexposed and then you'll get back in post and you'll be looking at the clip and you'll be wondering, why is my exposure right? I went by my eye, which is normally pretty good, and the screen is not accurate. I find this is in harsh, sunny environments when it's like this, and I do have my screen set to these sunny weather settings, but it still doesn't show correctly. But if you go through the EVF and look, it's correct. The exposure is correct. I've done tests for both. So that is a pain in the butt. A big pain in the butt. And I don't know how to get rid of that. People have said it's because you're using the sunny settings. I've changed it to the lower settings too and it still gave me the same problems. So whether it's an issue with my camera specifically or all of them, I don't know. There are other people that said they've had the same issue, but it's a problem for me. So I end up using the EVF way more than I did with the A6300 which I didn't have this issue with. So yeah, that's a bit of a pain for me and it's frustrating sometimes. If you're using the Xeon Crane and it's balanced on here and you kind of look through, you just can't do it, so it's a pain. That is the only real big, big issue. So of everything that I talk about today, that is the biggest problem with this camera. I'll tell you that now before you get to the end and you hear me talk about everything else. That's the only big problem. So if you can deal with that, great. Another issue with the screen, it's not really an issue. It's something that I guess I have an issue with maybe more than other people will. The screen quality is not the greatest. I didn't have an issue with the screen, really, at all. It seemed fine, like in terms of quality, until I used one of my friend's Fuji cameras and I was like, whoa, why is this screen so good? And I was that shocked by it. Honestly, it's like going from standard definition to high definition. The difference was incredible. And it's because the number of dots that Sony uses on this screen, and by dots, I mean um, like, PPI, pixels per inch, that kind of thing. It's a lot less on this than some other camera companies use, specifically Canon uses higher quality ones. Fuji uses high quality ones. I think this is just under a million. I know Canon and Fuji use two, three million dot ones. So it, it's a big difference in quality and it's more of a personal preference, I suppose. But once you've used something else and then you come back to this, it just feels inferior. That's annoying. So I wish that Sony would put a higher quality screen on this next time. Now I do believe on the A7R3 they use a higher quality screen. So they probably did it to keep the cost down, but at the same time it's nice to have a good quality screen on there. So just an annoyance I guess. Uh, and then the other thing that I have a little bit of an issue with, or not really an issue, but again comparing it to other cameras, the IBIS is, is okay, but it's not great. And you really sometimes have to still hold it really steady if you're going handheld. You can get stuff usable handheld, but it's just not fantastic compared to something like the GH5, which has phenomenal, phenomenal IBIS in-body image stabilization. And I really wish this had that, but it's okay. It still works for photos. It's really, really good. Definitely allows you to shoot at a slightly slower shutter speed and still get a sharp image. But for video, you can notice it sometimes, unless you shoot in 120. If you shoot 120 then you can just smooth out everything and it looks nice and smooth. I digress. So that is my thoughts on the a7 III and my in-depth kind of six month later, how's it handling kind of review thing. I don't even know what this is. Just talking to you about my experiences with this, having used it for about six months time. So what am I thinking about doing next with this? Is it gonna to continue to be my A-cam? Well, yes, it is for now. That being said, I am looking at retiring my A6300, and by retiring I mean putting on Kijiji. We use Kijiji here in Canada to sell stuff, kind of like Craigslist or eBay. And I want to sell it. And I want to upgrade to something else, something new that's coming out. Try it out when it comes out. And what I'm looking at right now, none of these cameras are announced. I'm looking at potentially the successor to the A6500, which is allegedly the A6000, no, the A6000, no, the A7000 or the A9 Mini, it's also been called. Apparently has some very good features. 10-bit uh, color, 4K60, uh, potentially a flippy screen. And that's something I'm looking at. I'm also looking at the A7S III, which would then make this the B cam, if it has as good features as everyone else says. Similar features apparently to what the A7000 will have uh, with 4K60, 10-bit color, that flip screen. Let's just talk about that flip screen for a second. 
I think a common misconception is everybody thinks that we want flip screens and by we I mean people that do YouTube videos. I think people want, I think people think that we want them because we want to vlog. That is not the case. I mean, yeah, some people want it for that. I don't really vlog that much. When I do, it's a little bit here and there. Yes, it's nice to be able to expose yourself quickly. Otherwise you have to kind of expose your hand, make sure you're in focus, test the clip. Yeah, that's good. You might do like two or three takes to get it. So that would be nice. But the other thing is when you're down low angles, you're off to the side. If you want to kind of film someone and just look here while you're in it, like there's so many different situations. Like right now I'm using a monitor. You can't see why I'm using a monitor. It would be nice to sometimes just quickly set up the camera, be able to film a segment and know you're in frame, know you're exposed properly. And a flip screen is so useful for that. For people that make videos, it's a useful feature. And I think camera companies should just put it in there as standard. It's just a feature people will use. If Sony can put in that feature with 4K60, with their amazing autofocus, 10-bit color, and a flip screen, I can tell you right now, that camera will sell better than any other camera next year, and it's probably not gonna come till next year. But I can tell you that right now, with 100% certainty. So I, I just don't know why they don't do it. Anyway, I got off on a bit of a tangent there. So yeah, that's what I'm looking at. I'm also looking at a GH5. Why not try it out? It's a very, very well-reviewed camera, but then it's a little bit older, so. I know Panasonic has some newer full frame cameras coming next year, so those are also an option, but no one's been able to test them out yet. It's just spec sheets with the fake body I think people have seen. So there's a lot of exciting cameras coming down the line and uh, I'm very interested. It's a very exciting time for cameras for sure. So I appreciate you watching today. Hopefully you managed to get some information out of this maybe you're looking to get, uh, answer some questions that you had from a real person's point of view, a real person's perspective of using this camera for six months uh, heavily and I can tell you I've used it very heavily. I've put it through its paces, so hopefully I've helped you out. Sub button down below, click like, all that stuff. Yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Uh, I'm gonna end this video as well with some of my favorite shots I've shot with this the past six months, so don't go away right now. Here's some nice video. I'll see you guys in the next one. See ya. Oh